Okay, so kind of, I, I guess, moving to exercise. So we talked a bit about exercise before. Um, so now I understand that um, endurance training gives you or activates BDNF. Well, it activates, it creates BDNF. Yeah. Stimulates its production. Yeah. Stimulates its production, yes. So um, what about uh, resistance training? Does that also work? To my knowledge, resistance training hasn't been looked at. Uh, aerob aerobic exercise does, mm. for sure. Uh, yeah. It's actually aerobic exercise is much more potent in increasing BDNF levels in the brain than is intermittent fasting. They both, they both increase BDNF, but aerobic exercise is better. Now, BDNF, it's a very interesting story. Okay, so regular exercise is a hedge against anxiety and depression. Mm. And it turns out the most commonly prescribed antidepressant drugs, the serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors like Prozac, Paxil, et cetera. Their antidepressant effect is mediated by BDNF. They increase BDNF production in the brain, similar to exercise. Oh, okay, so exercise is better. Um, so does that need to be, so what would HIT work? High intensity, short bursts or? Probably. Probably. I, I, I say probably, but it, one mean. problem in humans is uh, there's been a number of studies measuring BDNF levels in the blood, but it turns out that the nerve cells in the brain aren't the only cells that produce BDNF. For example, your heart cells produce BDNF. And so to get a measure of BDNF levels in the human brain, you really actually have to take cerebral spinal fluid, mm. do a spinal tap. And uh, uh, most people aren't going to volunteer to do that just uh, for an exercise study uh, because there's yeah. some potential risks. Um, but in animals where we can actually, whatever, put running wheels in their cages, put them on treadmill, kill them, take out their brains uh, and measure BDNF directly in the brain tissue. You know, it's very clear there. And the physiology, all of the, everything I've talked about, there's no differences between rodents and humans in anything I've talked about today. Right. right. So. The, yeah, the, the, in the way that they work, the physio, okay. Yeah. Um, Okay, so, so, so I guess one of the major benefits actually of doing long distance running or doing resist, uh, yeah, endurance training is that it helps your brain grow, right, as well as the other parts, yep. um, as well as uh, keeping you fitter. So as we get older, right, our brain gets uh, less effective in some ways. So can we continue to grow new brain cells? And you know, what would be the best way of kind of encouraging that? The answer is uh, we think so, definitely in, in laboratory animals. There is now new producing new nerve cells from stem cells. There's only two brain regions where that occurs. And one is a brain region that's very important in learning and memory. It's called the hippocampus. And um, yeah, exercise, engaging in intellectual challenges regularly, like we're doing right now, and intermittent fasting can all st well, stimulate what we call neurogenesis, the production of new neurons from stem cells in the hippocampus. Mm. Okay. Um, there's also evidence that exercise and intellectual challenges and, uh, and intermittent fasting can increase the number of synapses, the connections between neurons. 
at least in the hippocampus. Uh, and those data are from animals. Again, it's hard to, we really can't study those in humans because uh, you actually have to look at the brain tissue itself, take the brain out, cut it into slices and look under a microscope to actually see the, the neuron, the stem cells, the neurons, the synapses. There's no, no imaging method. Magnetic resonance imaging, for example, its resolution is an order of magnitude below or more below what's required to actually look at individual neurons or even small groups of neurons. So with functional imaging, essentially you're looking kind of in regional changes in, act, in activity in neural networks you know, and, and big hundreds and thousands of neurons. Right. So there's there's no way to study individual nerve cells in a in humans in in vivo, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the intellectual activity, if it includes like physical action as well, does that kind of is that additive? So would learning an instrument where you have to think and act would that be better? My guess is yes, but I, I'm not aware of. Of, of data on that. Uh, it makes a lot of sense from an evolutionary perspective. And again, and, and I've published an article on this, a, a major force or driver for brain evolution, including human brain, was food scarcity. As far as we know, the earliest tools invented by humans were tools that served the purposes of acquiring or processing food. Flake stones, uh, spears, bows and arrows, uh, cooking, uh, harnessing of fire. And if, if you look at human brain size based on skulls, cranial capacity measuring the volume of a skull from, from humans before the agricultural revolution when they were all hunter-gatherers compared to modern day, it's actually getting smaller. So uh, when, you're, when food is scarce, again, um, your brain has to be able to function well and your body at the same time, you know, expending a lot of mental and physical effort to get the food. So, um, so the mechanisms that enabled success in food acquisition uh, all revolved around this being able to function well in a food deprived state and, and think, you know, intellectually creative, your creativity has to be good. You know, how am I going to work with my friends to corner this big animal? How am I going to, how can we more easily kill an animal uh, rather than just strangling it with our hands, <laughs> you know, and, and so on. Uh, and how do we uh, get food so that it lasts longer by cooking it or yeah, well, actually, killing infectious agents and so on and so on. Right. Yes. Um, okay. So, is there any? Do you have any kind of diet that particularly helps uh, the the brain? So, so, in particular, I'm thinking like the brain is mostly fat, right? So, is it mostly fat? That's a lot of fat. Yeah. Is it? Is a lot of fat. Um, is it? Do we need special fats like omega threes, or does having the right fats help? Yeah, omega threes. Uh, there's good evidence omega threes are good for the brain, and maybe as importantly, omega sixes are not so good. Mm. Yeah. So, cutting down on uh, omega sixes. Yeah, omega sixes seem not to be good for health. Right. 
So I heard it's like it's the percentage. So it's with the body will just put whichever one it has, and if it has more omega six than omega threes, then it puts those in. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Okay, which is why so fish has higher omega three and low omega six. Generally. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so thank you very much for your your time today. Can so can people follow you online? Do you have? Um, you could enter the link to. If you go on PubMed and just put Matson MP, mm -hmm. yeah, and they can look at every publication, <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay. Or most of it, most of them, anyway. Most of them. And, and if if they're interested in an article on there that the full text isn't available, I'm happy to send it to them if they send me an email. Okay, excellent. Yeah, we will mention that, and that that would be very helpful. Okay, so Dr. Madsen, thank you very much for your time today. That was uh, very, very informative. And uh, good hey, luck. Richard, with... I enjoyed it and keep up the good work of spreading authoritative information by interviewing experts. <laughs> we, will, we will do that. And I, when you get your book published, it will be excellent to uh, have you back. Okay. Okay, look forward to okay. that. Okay, have a good day. You too, thank you. Yeah, bye. Yeah. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button and choose all for any new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.